All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Tina Selig back to Google for her second Talks at Google presentation. Uh, Professor Selig is the Executive Director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the best-selling author of What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. Um, today, she speaks to us about her latest book, Ingenious. Um, it brings lessons from her teaching and research and creativity and shows how anyone can increase their creative genius and creative potential. Um, Tina remains one of the most inspirational teachers at Stanford, both for myself and the many other folks that have been through her class. Um, her courses on creativity impact not only engineers and, and D-School grads, but lawyers, doctors, um, public health advocates, and, and humanitarians in general. Um, lessons from her course are applied in companies throughout the world, including here at Google, where we have a program called CSI that teaches many of the same things that were taught in her class. Um, together with other proud alumni in her class here at Google and in the audience today, please join me in welcoming Tina back to Google. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. It is my total pleasure to be back here again. It was exactly three years ago that I was here giving you a talk about my last book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. And who would have known that three, three years later I would have a new book out and we'll get to share it with you. So this book is based on my dozen years teaching classes on creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship at Stanford. And I decided I wanted to capture what I've learned through these experiences. And uh, it's interesting, I had lunch with some of the Googlers today and they asked me how I got from being a neurophysiologist to being a, you know, to teaching classes on creativity and innovation. And it turns out, I really went into neuroscience initially because of my interest in creativity. I wanted to know how the brain generated ideas. And I have to say, after finishing four years in my PhD at Stanford, um, I realized that we were still pretty far from understanding how the brain works and how creativity is generated. So I went out into the real world to look at creativity in action. I've worked in startup companies, and I'm just delighted to be at Stanford now um, for over a dozen years, uh, really focusing on this uh, creativity in individuals, in teams, and in organizations. So the first question I want to ask you is, where do ideas come from? Where do ideas come from? Anyone? Any? From inspiration. OK. And where do you get inspiration? Putting two unconnected things together as oh, an example. Great. Connecting things that are unconnected. What else? From your environment? You know, the interesting thing here is if I had asked you, how do you do um, experiments to figure out how the world works? you would end up coming up with some very, very clear ideas about how we do a science experiment. From the time we're little, we are given classes and taught about how to come up with hypotheses, how to test them, how to analyze the data, and basically how to discover how the world works. But we aren't given a parallel set of processes to think about how to invent new things. Now here you are in Google where there's invention, invention going on all the time. But one of the things that happens is we aren't actually really clear about all the variables that are coming into play. And so what I've been trying to do is figure out a way, a model that shapes how we think about creativity and innovation in individuals and teams and organizations. So I'm going to start out by showing you a picture of this model and I'm going to take it apart and put it back together. The model I call the innovation engine. And it looks at the things that happen inside you, the inside of this Mobius strip, your knowledge, imagination, attitude, and the outside, the things that have to come into play in the outside world, the resources, habitat, and the culture. Now, the interesting thing is if you ask most people to make a list of the things that are important for creativity, they usually start with imagination because that's the obvious place to start. So we're going to start there, too with your imagination. Now, we are actually all imaginative. We wouldn't be sitting here or standing here uh, where we are today if we hadn't been. We had to learn through creative problem solving in every single aspect of our lives, right? Walking, talking, riding a bicycle, and certainly all the products that you're developing here today. But why is it that many people don't think of themselves as creative? And a lot of it comes from the type of training and environments we've been in. Think about it. When we're in kindergarten, we're given problems like this. What two numbers add up to 10? Or, or what, if we're given 5 and 5, what's the answer? What's the answer to this? 10. OK. I got a little ahead of myself there. OK? If we're given this, there's one right answer, because we're taught that one right answer. But what if we ask the question in a different way? What if we ask what two numbers add us to 10? 
How many answers are there to this? Infinite. Infinite. Thank you very much. Right? You could, of course, take the obvious answers like 8 plus 2 and 3 plus 7, but negative numbers, fractions, decimals. And if we don't ask questions in the right way, we don't come up with the right answers. And this is very, very important because one of the first steps to increasing your imagination is asking the right question. Think about it. If I ask you um, if you'll build a bridge for me, you could go off and build a bridge. Or you could come back to me and say, why do we need a bridge in the first place? And if I said I need to get across the bay, wow, there are so many ways to do that, right? You could walk around. You could swim. You could take a boat. You could have a helicopter. You could have a tunnel. You could have a hot air balloon. The fact is, if we don't ask the question properly in the beginning, we don't end up coming with the right answers or the whole field of possible solutions. Albert Einstein, as quoted as saying, if he had a problem to solve, and it was terribly difficult, and his life depended upon it, and he only had an hour to solve the problem, he would spend the first 55 minutes framing the problem. Because the frame of the problem is essentially the frame into which the answers will fall. And so we have to think about practicing this. This is not trivial. If you think about it, the entire Copernican revolution came about by reframing what we think of the solar system. Instead of saying that the Earth is the center of the solar system, by reframing it and saying, wow, what would happen if the sun was the center of the solar system? All of a sudden, it opened up the entire field of astronomy. This is not tr just true in science. This is true in art as well. Think of artists like Escher who challenge us to look, question the foreground and the background. And most of his artwork really looks at changing the way we frame the picture. There are some really fun ways to practice doing this every day, really fun ways. My favorite way to do it is using jokes. So um, you guys probably are familiar with the Pink Panther. The Pink Panther in the um, Inspector Clouseau uh, looks at a um, a dog that's on the street and he's about to go and pet it and he says, does your dog bite? And uh, the uh, person who's carrying the dog says, no, my dog doesn't bite. He reaches down, dog bites him and he says, what happened? He says, well, that's not my dog. <laughs> The fact is the frame changes in the middle. And this happens all the time. If you look at jokes, you will find that jokes are funny because the frame switches. Here's an example. Uh, two women are walking, uh, playing golf one day, and uh, a funeral goes by on, in the cemetery next door, and one of them stops, quietly bows her head and says a prayer, and her friend says, wow, you are the most thoughtful person I could ever imagine. She says, well, it's the least I could do. We were married for 25 years. <laughs> Again, the frame switched in the middle of the joke. That's what makes it funny. So look at jokes as a way for you to practice, the, you know, even on a day-to-day -day level, how to frame problems. Now, another way to increase your imagination, and you brought this up earlier, is to connect and combine things that are not obvious. And this is an incredibly powerful tool because most new inventions actually come about by putting things together that already exist but in non-obvious ways. One of my favorite ways to explore this is looking at the Japanese art of Shindogu. And the art of Shindogu is creating unuseless inventions. Now, these are things that aren't really useful, and they're not really useless, but they're kind of unuseful. So here's an example of you know, the shoes with the uh, um, umbrellas on them. Well, it might not be completely practical, but it opens up a really interesting set of ideas. And you say, wow, what might that be if we had something that was equivalent to umbrellas on our shoes? Or speaking of shoes, what if we had little dustbins on our shoes? Now, I would say, you know, this is actually really interesting. We normally have to get down on the floor to sweep things up. What kind of ideas does this unlock by thinking about what happens if you put a dustpan on your shoes? Or what if you put a mop on a baby's tummy, right? Why not, instead of the baby making a mess, the baby's job is to clean up after itself, OK? So as it's, uh, you put it on the floor, you know, it's sort of like better than a little robot. You know, the baby crawls around, cleans up the floor. OK, so you have framing problems. You have connecting and combining ideas. It's also important, now this is, this is um, an example of a uh, everyday way to connect and combine ideas. One of my favorite approaches is the, using the New Yorker cartoon contest. How many of you read the New Yorker? Lots of you? Okay, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and in the back there's always the contest uh, where there's a, a cartoon that has no caption. And 
almost always there are things that are incongruent that are in the picture. Things that shouldn't be together, things that are out of scale, things that seem ridiculous when you put them in the same frame. And it's your job to connect them, to create some storyline that in a really fun and interesting way connects them. So here's a picture of two businessmen and a hobby horse. And here is the caption that they had. We'll start you out here, then give you more responsibilities as you gain experience. OK, maybe that could happen here at Google. I don't know. So I said you've got to connect and combine ideas. You have to reframe problems. You also need to challenge assumptions. Now, what does this mean? This is actually critically important for your imagination. It means going beyond the first right answer. Most of us, when we try to solve a problem, come up with the first answer and think we're done. And this is terribly problematic if you want to come up with a really creative solution. And it's one of the reasons that we do brainstorming, because brainstorming is a great way, if used properly, to really generate a lot of ideas, often ideas that are unexpected. The way I like to teach my students how to challenge assumption is I give them problems that don't have a right answer. In fact, they're problems that I have no idea how I would tackle, and so I want to be as surprised by the types of results they come up with as they are. Uh, let me tell you a, a story about a recent project I gave. This was in Japan. I was asked to run um, a couple of workshops with students at Osaka University. I want to frame this by saying, I was told I'm going there because these students are not creative. And they kind of wanted to prove it to me. I said, no, 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 no. Your students are amazingly creative, and I can demonstrate it. So after running a two-hour workshop with them, I gave them this challenge. And this is the design brief. Essentially, it says, your job is to create as much value as possible, value measured in any way you want in two hours, starting with the contents of one trash can. You can pick whatever trash can you want. So basically, we're taking something that doesn't even have zero value. It has negative value, right? This is basically you pay people to take away the trash. So we're going to take, this, take something that people think has no value and create as much value as possible in two hours. So to raise the stakes a little bit, I also invited uh, my colleagues around the world in the US, in Asia, Europe, Latin America to participate with their students as well. So we now had thousands of students around the world who were participating at the same time, each one picking whatever garbage can they wanted and creating as much value as possible in two hours. They had the, basically some time to think about it, but as soon as they opened up, you know, basically spilled out the garbage can, they had two hours. Interesting thing happened that was unexpected. The students ended up spending a bunch of time at the beginning discussing and thinking about and debating what value meant to them. They thought about happiness and health and community, and knowledge, and of course, financial security. And that ended up helping them really frame the way they looked at whatever garbage they had. So you want to see what some of the students did? OK, so this is a team. The first one is from Ecuador. And they picked a garbage can I probably would not have picked. It was a garbage can filled with yard waste, all sorts of leaves. Wow, what could you do with this? I mean, this is you know compost. Well, these students looked at it a different way and created a mural with all of this yard waste. Pretty cool, beautiful. There was a girl in Ireland who found a garbage can filled with old socks that her mom was throwing out from her brother's sock drawer. All these holy old socks. Boy, I probably wouldn't have picked that one either. She took them, cut them apart, sewed them back together, and made a beautiful sweater. Pretty cool. Wow, who thought of making a sweater out of old socks? Pretty interesting idea. And then there was a team in Japan. And this team went to the local laundromat. And they got the plastic bags and the hangers. And they realized there was a spot on the campus that was called the dead zone. It was part of a big grassy hill that was all kind of damp because the, the grass was always a little bit wet. And people didn't want to sit there because it was kind of uncomfortable. So they made these mats that you could sit on. And you could roll them up and keep them in your backpack. And then whenever you wanted, you'd roll them out. But they didn't stop there. They decided to create an entire community around this. And they painted games like Twister on these mats. So that when you got there and you rolled out your, uh, your, your mat and sat on it, you could play a game with someone else there. And in fact, what ended up happening is the local vendors started coming by and selling coffee and pastries. And they created an entire community around this area that had really been a dead zone. So we've talked about framing problems, connecting, combining ideas, challenging assumptions. But the fact is, your imagination is not enough. These are great places to start. You need to start with a base of knowledge. 
And if you do not have a base of knowledge, then you don't have any tools for your imagination. This is incredibly important. Your knowledge is a toolbox for your imagination. The more you know, the more you have to work with. Now the interesting thing is, it doesn't have to be something that is even directly related to the problem you're trying to solve. In fact, uh, at lunch I had a very fascinating conversation with some of the Googlers here about neurophysiology. And we ended up talking about um, really in single cell electrophysiology and talking about all the lessons you can learn about organizations and social networking based on looking at individual nerve cells. Pretty cool? And I could talk about this and, and share these ideas because I'm a neurophysiologist. And the fact is you can bring knowledge from any field, but you need something to work with. So how do we get knowledge? We get knowledge, of course, by going to lectures and by reading books and by going to school. But you know what? You also gain knowledge by paying attention to the world, by being more observant than anyone else. Because when you're paying attention, you see problems that need to get solved, and you often see solutions that are right in front of you. Now, most people don't do this. In fact, magicians know this. This is why magicians play with your attention. They know that a single a hand gesture or a little joke or you know, pointing to someone in the audience can totally distract you, and you don't see what's going on here. On the other side are comedians, like Jerry Seinfeld, okay, who draw your attention to things and basically fo focus on things that you didn't pay attention to, like, did you ever notice that, you know, standing in line or, you know, buying shoes, or they pick something mundane and focus on it, and that becomes very funny with that level of scrutiny. One of uh, my favorite stories about how to increase this comes from Stanford. One of my colleagues, uh, Bob Siegel, uh, who teaches classes all over the world. He takes students to Madagascar and to the Galapagos and to Pap Padua, New Guinea. And he basically takes them on these excursions where they are essentially naturalists. Well, he does a class called the Stanford Safari. And a two-week immersion program, the students act like naturalists at Stanford. Now, not only do they walk away learning everything from the pest controller and the organist and the librarian and all the presidents, you know, they end up getting this, of course, deep dive into the university. They also walk away with an incredible appreciation for what can happen when you actually pay attention. So we have our imagination, we have our knowledge base, but you also need the attitude that a problem can get solved. If you do not have the confidence, the motivation, the drive to push through when a problem seems daunting, you are not going to gain the knowledge, you're not going to engage your imagination, and you're not going to come up with a solution. Most people in the world view themselves as puzzle builders. That means they're going out getting all the pieces they need and putting them together to solve their problem. But what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that if you're missing a piece, what happens? Oops, it can't be done. And another thing about a puzzle is you're basically solving a problem that's a known problem, right? A known problem with a known solution. But what if you're trying to solve problems that don't have a known solution? And in fact, they're really challenging. Instead, you need to view yourself as a quilt maker. Quilt makers are people who take the resources that they have available to them and they bring them to bear on the problem that they're trying to solve. And by looking at this image of this quilt, I hope you realize that the results are truly remarkable, much more re remarkable than putting together a known puzzle. It's interesting, though, because we grow up and we usually hear Murphy's Law, which says, if anything can go wrong, what? It will. Right? In fact, often people, I don't want to ask how many of you have this, you know, a poster in your office. But the idea is this was a common thing where people would have a poster that says, if anything can go wrong, it will. Well, there's a problem with that. If that's what you believe, then you're just going to basically stop every time you find a problem. Peter Diamantis, who runs Singularity University and the X Prize Foundation, walked into one of his colleagues' offices, and they had this sign up, Murphy's Law. He got so angry, he picked up a marking pen, he went up, crossed out at will, and wrote, fix it. <laughs> if anything can go wrong, fix it. And that is the mindset of a true innovator and an entrepreneur is someone who, when they see a daunting challenge, says, I am going to do everything in my power to fix it. So this is your internal combustion engine for creativity, your knowledge, your imagination, and your attitude. 
Your knowledge is the toolbox for your imagination. Your imagination catalyzes the transformation of your knowledge into new ideas, and your attitude is the spark that sets this in motion. But you know what? You can be as creative as you want. If you are not in an environment that stimulates this, then basically you're hosed. And this is a problem in a lot of places because you get really creative people who are really want to solve big problems and they're in environments that don't foster it. So you have to look at other pieces of the puzzle. The first thing you have to look at is the habitat. Now you are incredibly fortunate here at Google to have this incredible habitat. You walk around and I just want to take pictures at every corner because you walk into the, into the whole facility, into the Googleplex, and you say, this is a place that is designed for me to be creative. And this builds on the fact that when we're kids, it looks more like kindergarten, right? In fact, the color scheme matches that in kindergarten. Primary colors, right? Lots of, lots of things that stimulate your imagination, lots of manipulatives, the space is very flexible. Really cool. When you go into kindergarten, do you think that's a place you could be creative? Absolutely. But unfortunately, what happens is that most of us graduate from kindergarten and we end up in classrooms that look like this. Wow, this is really disappointing. And you know, the rows of chairs are lined up in, in, in straight lines, they're bolted to the floor. This is to make it easy for the teacher so that it, you know, things are easy to clean up. Do you think it makes it appropriate for creativity? No, and then we say, you know, these kids, they're just not so creative anymore. And then they get out of this, they, they graduate from high school and college, and they go to work in environments like this. Wow, and then again people say, our people are not creative. Well, this is ridiculous. As I said, we're all creative and we're waiting for this to be unleashed. I feel fortunate enough to work at Stanford and where our spaces are very conducive to creativity. This is a picture at the D School at Stanford where we have our uh, ubiquitous red couches, the furniture all moves. It's not expensive. We have most of the furniture is from Ikea. It's, you know, um, foam cubes that can be moved around, lots of whiteboards. You walk into the space and you say, wow, this is a place I could be creative. And, you know, here are some pictures from my class. It looks like a kindergarten. The students are working actually on a pretty complicated problem here, but they've got the sort of materials, you know, Play-Doh and markers and construction paper, or they're working on the floor, working on a simulation game. And again, you know, it looks more like a kindergarten. And as we know, innovative companies do this well. This is at uh, IDEO where when somebody leaves to go on vacation, it's very likely that they'll come back and their office has been transformed. You go on a road trip, you come back and your office is now in the back of a van. You go on your honeymoon in Paris, you come back, your office looks like the Eiffel Tower. This is not frivolous. This is a messaging that every single thing you do is ripe for creativity. And here's a picture, right? This is, this is Google in Zurich. Um, I don't know exactly what these pods are for, but they're very, uh, obviously you walk in, it feels very playful. Or at Pixar, where there's a slide going through the middle of the building. So having an environment, a physical environment, is important. You also need to think about the rules, the rewards, the constraints, the incentives. All of those things come into play. And those things all contribute to the type of habitats we live in. But in addition, we are really sensitive to the types of resources we have available to us. Now, what are resources? The interesting thing is here we are in Silicon Valley, and we think of resources, wow, we certainly have a lot of money around, a lot of money that we can spend on projects. But resources come in so many different flavors. Think of natural resources. Think of communities. Think of processes that we have in place. Each of these can be leveraged. And one of the problems is people who don't live here often think that they need to replicate what we're doing in Silicon Valley. They think that the only types of resources that are valuable are the ones that are found here. But other parts of the world have equally valuable resources that they need to learn to leverage. So besides the habitat and the resources, it's incredibly important to think about the culture. Because the culture in any organization affects everything you do, you think, you feel, you act, is affected by the culture. Now one of the most important pieces of a culture is a willingness to experiment, to try lots of things and keep what works. And one of the problems is that people often, especially as an organization gets bigger and bigger, get more afraid of failing and also get more afraid of showing things to something, someone who's more senior until it's fully baked. So they spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of resources, right, especially if you've got resources, on making a project look finished. 
where there's a huge problem with this. The problem is you might have committed to something that's a bad idea. And now you've put a bunch of time and money and energy into this. And in fact, when you show something to someone and it looks fully done, they're much less likely to give you feedback. One of my favorite examples of a way to do this well comes from IDEO. And I'm going to show you a video clip of, uh, came from one of their projects, one of their recent projects. They were designing a new iPhone app called Monster Maker in their toy group. And the idea was, uh, it was a little game and they wanted to see if the concept was going to work. So this is the prototype that they did to test the concept. I want you to tell me how much money they spent, how much time I took, how much engineering talent, and whether this was effective. Music. So this is um, possible dance moves for monster making. So music starts, and I'm the player. So I come in and I touch the monster, and he gives me a special dance move. <laughs> I go and touch again, and he does a different one. And it can go for as long as I want. And he has a few signature moves. And when I've had enough, and I'm done dancing, I touch the back button. Pauses and music stops. Monster me. <laughs> cool. Sonic. Come on, Sonic. Whoa. Get in there, <laughs> okay, so it's kind of funny, isn't it? But how much time did it take to do? Like nothing, right? Maybe maybe a half an hour to make this. Okay. How much money did it cost to do this? Practically nothing, right? How much engineering talent did it require? Nothing. How effective was it in testing the idea? Fabulous. This is the attitude you need to be willing to try lots of things, do rapid prototypes, and get the feedback. One of the problems we have also about trying lots of things is we feel as though if it doesn't work out well that it's failure. And you know, we talk a lot about Silicon Valley and about our comfort with failure, but I really want to reframe the way we think about that. As a scientist, when I do an experiment that doesn't turn out as I expected, I don't call it a failure, I call it data. This is really important. Data is information. And we love data. Data tells you about interesting things. In fact, some of the most incredible discoveries in science came from experiments that were failed, that ended up with results that were surprising. And so the fact is you need to look at the same sort of surprising results in the same way as, wow, this didn't work. What does that tell us about our user? What does that tell us about our customer? What does that tell us about whatever we're looking at? Because that's incredibly useful information. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that culture is way beyond, way beyond just experimenting. The culture is like the background music of an organization. Now think about it, if you watch a movie, the background music is incredibly powerful character in that movie. When you watch a movie and something daunting is going to happen, the music tells you. When something wonderful is gonna happen, the music tells you. The music is the background soundtrack of any company. And we really need to keep that in mind both in a, uh, because it affects every single thing we do. So this is now the external engine for creativity, right? The resources, habitat, and culture. But let me show you how they all fit together. Because you might think, oh gee, well, that's kind of interesting. You made this little pretty picture with this Mobius with the inside and the outside. But there's actually a reason it's all braided together. Because the inside and the outside are there, but the inside and the outside dramatically affect each other. Let me show you how. You could look at imagination and habitat. Your habitat is the external manifestation of your imagination. If you don't imagine it, you can't build it. And also, the habitats you build directly affect the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act. Does that make sense? So essentially, we need to think, especially as we're managers of organizations, what sort of habitat am I building? Because the habitat I build will affect the way the people I work with think and feel and act. In addition, knowledge and resources are parallel. Because the more you know, the more resources you can unlock. And the types of resources you have determines what you know. Think about it. If there are lots of fish in our environment, it's likely I'm going to know something about fishing. And the more I know about fishing, the more fish I will catch. 
the more venture capitalists there are in my community, the more likely it is I'm going to know about venture capital. And the more venture capitalists, the more I know about venture capital, the more likely it is I'm going to get funding. Make sense? So the fact is resources and, um, and knowledge are directly related. In addition, attitude and culture are parallel. And this should seem obvious, right? The culture is the collective attitudes of the individuals. And of course, the culture affects how each of us feels. So let's look at a story of how we, all of these things work together. I was just recently in February in northern Thailand, and I met this wonderful woman. Her name is Lek, and she grew up in a very poor family up near Chiang Mai. And her family had an elephant. The elephant was part of her family, and she loved this elephant. She ended up learning as she got older that elephants in Thailand are treated very, very poorly. Um, they're in the logging industry where they're stepping on mines and getting horribly hurt. They're abused by tourists where they're completely overworked and, and really to total exhaustion. They're in circuses where they're, you know, they're basically treated terribly. She decided she had to do something about this. So let's look at this. She started with the motivation, the drive, the commitment to do something to help these elephants. She learned as much as she could about them. She gained her base of knowledge. Okay, she learned that there were only 500 elephants that are left in captivity, that thousands of them are, that, no, that are left in the wild, and that thousands of them are in captivity. She figured she needed to do something. So she leveraged the resources she had available, which were actually the sick and hurt elephants, to build a habitat, which was an elephant nature preserve. And she invites people to come there as volunteers and to work there, and people to come and visit any day. And so I went there with some of my colleagues. I was totally transformed by this experience. I was one of these tourists who would have come in and said, oh, let me go ride an elephant. But after spending a day there, I became as passionate as anyone else who was there about the fact that I needed to do something to help save these elephants and to help with their plight. And this is the point. You can start anywhere on this innovation engine. This Mobius strip is shaped like this because everything is intertwined. You can start by creating a habitat that stimulates others' imagination. You can start by gaining the knowledge that is going to fuel your imagination. And you certainly can start with an attitude that you want to start a problem, solve a problem, and then do everything you can to, to make it happen. The fact is, we each have the keys to this innovation engine. It's up to us to turn them. Thank you very much. So I would be delighted, oh, this is sort of just a, a summary here of all of this, um, but I would be delighted to answer any questions. You're going to ask questions. Perfect. I have a habit of asking the first question. Good, great. Um, actually, this isn't so much a question as I want to give a pointer to something that you said that resonated very well for, a, I think, for a bunch of us here, your um, IDEO prototype. Um, there was a small team here, uh, Alberto Savoya and Stephen Uller, sure. who, who were pushing um, this notion of predotyping, yeah. which um, resonated perfectly. And I think, the, uh, I guess it's, it's a sideways plug if, if, you ha if, if people in the audience haven't seen Alberto's video, predotyping.org. Um, I think it resonates very well with that specific example. Exactly. In fact, I know him, and I really am a huge fan of his work, and he's coming to run a workshop in my creativity class on prototyping. So it's all great. Thank you very much. Any other <coughs> questions, comments, thoughts? So let me ask you, while you're thinking about any questions you might have, what part of this, is anything surprising here? What was the most surprising? What was the most interesting? What was the most unusual? What might be the most valuable piece of this? Something that might be actionable for you. Anyone? Habitat. Habitat. So say more about that. Um, so one of uh, the, the, the uh, objects of the that we're not some more of a unique thing that we saw in zone space, that's not far enough to <coughs> habitat will tell us that the environment is Great, that the habitat is, re is really important. Yes. Right. Great. So what do you, oh, is there anything you'll do differently in your, the habitats that you're in? So I'm in a really boring office, and so I'll be fixing that. Ah, <laughs> great, terrific, great. Super, anyone else? Any other thoughts about, yeah? 
Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. I just kind of had a uh, question about kind of the culture, because I know you went into kind of the community uh, in Japan, and you know they were saying how people, students there weren't as creative. So I, I maybe just want to hear maybe a little bit more of your thoughts on the culture piece of all of this. Great, yeah, let, happy to. So here's the story behind the backstory behind that. Um, my last book, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20, um, has been relatively popular here in the U.S., but it became totally crazy popular in Asia, especially in Japan. And so they asked me to do a TV series for Japan on what was happening in my class. So we um, did an eight-part series. NHK from Japan did an eight-part eight TV series on my creativity class. And it showed eight weeks in a row in Japan. And everyone was very excited about this, but said, you know what, this would never work here. And I said, that's just not true. So they said, please come and prove it. So I ended up going and I worked with some students at Osaka University and could not have been any more impressed. Uh, the students walked out at the end saying, I had no idea I was this creative. And the fact is they had the knowledge, they had the imagination, they certainly had the attitude, but they needed to be in an environment that allowed them to unleash their creativity. And I find that so true. I mean, what people come here to Google and they walk in the door, they don't even have to know what their job is, right? You can hire people without them knowing what job they're going to do and say, I want to work here. Why? They walk in and they say, this is a habitat where I know I can really stretch my imagination. And I think it's something people are hungry for. <clears throat> Hey, this is great. I feel like um, one of the challenges for some of the young people in the room, and we probably, ha or everyone in the room, we probably have to read your book. Um, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of, of what you need to do, and, and the problem is just time. I work about 60 hours a week, and then beyond that, I want to watch TV and hang out with my girlfriend. And so I just finding time to be more creative and foster all of this. I love the US that question. I, I work probably the same number of hours, okay? It's, it's not about time, it's about an attitude. If you look at the things that you're doing as every problem is an opportunity for a creative solution, then you actually find that there are opportunities to bake this into your life in everything you're already doing. So I invite you to think that way, just try it, because um, even if it's walking into this room, so I have a whole chapter about observation and about you know paying attention. Um, even while you're sitting here looking around the room to train yourself to look at things that other people don't notice, right? How high are the ceilings? What are the floors made of? Who's sitting here? What, what, what's going on? Even in those little downtime moments to force yourself to think in a slightly different way, it really starts unlocking these opportunities. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm on the sales team, and one point about your presentation that really stuck with me is when you said that we all need a base of knowledge in order to be imaginative. And I think it's important to say that that base of knowledge we should have should be from all areas. As you pointed out, it could be from anywhere. Um, so just one example I wanted to share is I don't watch TV. I don't have cable. Like, I think a lot of it is a bunch of junk. But when I go home and I visit my family, they like to watch TV, so I'll sit there and you know, watch it with them. Uh, one day I watched, and we, I saw a commercial for the Domino's like, pizza tracker. I mean, for some reason, that, like, that gave me the idea of a new way to track ads. Like, customers call us, they give us an issue, we resolve it in secrecy, and then we tell it when we're done. And for some reason, that commercial taught me, oh, that's what customers care about. We should tell them every stage of the process, like they care about their pizza. I'm sure they care about these expensive ads you know, that we're supposed to run. Um, so had I not been exposed to knowledge that I, for so long, was ignoring because I don't like to watch TV, like that's just one idea that came to me in a totally unexpected place. Yeah, and in fact, it happens everywhere. Let me give you another example that is sort of related to Google. Um, there's a fellow, in fact, the story I, I told in my book, Ingenious, about him because it totally blew my mind in so many respects. His name is David Friedberg, and he used to work at Google. And he would, lived up in the city and he would drive to Google every day. And every day he drove to, to Google, he would pass this bicycle shack that was a you know, bike rental place near the train station. And he would notice that on days when it was raining, guess what? They were closed. And he would, every time he went by, go, oh, they're open today, they're closed today. Wow, isn't it interesting that their business is so dependent upon the weather? He started thinking what other businesses are affected by the weather and started thinking, of course, of ski resorts or movie theaters or farmers, um, all sorts of businesses that are affected, wedding planners. Okay, he decided to start a company that basically sells weather insurance 
to, to people who need it in a completely different way. Like farmers get crop insurance. So, but instead of that, they can just track the weather and you get paid if it rains. Okay, so you can basically figure it out. He, you know what the thing is? So first of all, it started with him observing something that probably other people didn't pay attention to, just the, the bicycle shack on the way to work that turned into a whole, a, a whole business. The other thing is all the people in the company knew nothing about weather, knew nothing about agriculture, but they brought in people who were neurophysiologists, who knew about you know, dynamic models, people who are astrophysicists, who knew how to analyze big data. Of course, over time, they're learning about meteorology, they're learning about agriculture, which they'll take to the next venture, but essentially, they came with a base of knowledge about with a completely different fields, brought them to bear on creating a brand new and, and quite successful venture. Well, I just want to thank you so much. It is a huge honor to be here. Thank you so much.